People matter. Results count. Hello and welcome. My name is Brian Kaplan. I'm editor of The Banker magazine. I'm hosting a discussion this afternoon about the World Payments Report 2012, which is put together by Capgemini, Royal Bank of Scotland and EFMA. With me I have John Lesignardi, who's the Corporate Vice President and Chief Sales and Marketing Officer for Capgemini Global Financial Services. Kevin Brown, who's the Global Head of Transaction Services Product for Inter International Banking for the Royal Bank of Scotland. And Makota Shibata, who's the Principal Analyst E-Business and IT Initiatives Division for the Bank of to Tokyo Mitsubishi UFJ. Now, John, if I could start with you, it's a very challenging time to be in the payments business, isn't it, for banks? I mean, we've seen masses of regulation. Now we're seeing non-banks enter the payment space. Is it possible for banks to still make a decent living out of the payments business? Obviously, the answer is definitely yes. Uh, even in spite of market volatility uh, and the regulatory landscape, payment volume, when I mean non-cash payment volume, grew by 7.1% in 2010, reaching 283 billion transaction, with an additional 8.2% expected in 2011. This is more than 15% year on year. Now, if we look at the different geographies, we had US and Europe experienced about 5% growth in 2010 and potentially same growth in 2011. If we look at developing countries, it's up to 16.7 or 9%, sorry, uh, in a region like, uh, you know, the developing countries and up to 30% in Russia, in India, in China, sorry. So all in all, a very uh, substantial uh, and increased growth. So we could say, in other words, growth everywhere, but very strong growth in, in, in key emerging markets where traditionally there's been cash payment, but now we're moving to more of a non-cash basis. Exactly. And if I want to finalize on that, if we look at Brazil, Brazil has experienced a very significant growth. It's now becoming the third non-cash market uh, in the world, uh, putting all three, you know, Brazil, China, Russia in the ten to top 10 payment markets. So Brazil alone is 20 billion transactions when the rest of the BRIC country all together is a little bit more than 30 billion. So we suggest that now maybe for payments, seeing Brazil grows, BRIC acronym may no longer be relevant for that. Now Makoto, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the situation in Japan. Japan's obviously uh, a, a developed country, uh, but uh, you, you have some differences because you have uh, more of a cash economy here, but at the same time we've seen big developments in things like mobile wallets. So perhaps you could give us a bit of a sketch of, of how the Japan payment situation looks. Right. In terms of non-cash payment, uh, credit card um, is dominant as an instrument and it covers a wide range of uh, prices. but. Uh, it's quite interesting to see that for uh, low value payment, uh, uh, M uh, wallet and E wallet has been used quite widely. E wallet is uh, uh, contactless chip payment using a plat plastic card, and M wallet uh, or OSIF KTI is something that uh, you put this e wallet on a mobile phone. So, okay. oh, oh, so, so, so for KTI is, is mm -hmm. Japanese for mobile wallet, I think that's right, right, right. isn't it? Right, that's yeah. right. So by holding a mobile device, you can have a variety of uh, e-wallets on one device. Okay, and this has really taken off in Japan, is that correct? Yes, yeah. and as a result of the expansion in this m-wallet, uh, we are observing that the circulation, uh, volume of circulation of small coins have uh, gone down in past five, six years. And last year, the uh, Japanese government didn't issue a one yen coin at all. Okay, that's right. Interesting. Kevin, I mean, in the World Payments Report, we're seeing very large growth in electronic and mobile payments. Uh, is that something you expect to continue? I think we're seeing a number of different factors in terms of movement between the different non-cash non payment devices. So we've got a switch and, and certainly a focus on debit cards. Uh, one in three transactions are now debit card um, in terms of the overall piece. And, and I think what you see there is potentially a, uh, yeah, a switch from, from credit transactions where perhaps um, you know, consumers are not looking to take credit risk or take credit on in the current environment. 
uh, but, but also an increasing availability of debit cards for smaller transactions, um, for pay and go type transactions as well. Um, looking at mobile and, and e-payments, we've seen uh, certainly significant growth, around 20% from e-payments and, and potentially 50% plus for mobile payments. And I think it's worth also noting that you know, of those mobile payments, 80% plus um, actually come from non-bank um, payment providers. So clearly the market is, is growing and emerging with lots of new players. Um, how quickly and how uh, how widely that will grow, um, I suspect you know, what we're seeing is uh, both demand from consumers but also some challenges now from merchants in terms of how they acquire those payments and how they use those payments to, for people to pay goods. So, so Jean, I mean, if, if that's the case that uh, you know, we, we're seeing this uh, non-banks come into the payments uh, area, especially in, in mobile, uh, how worried do you think the banks should be about about that. It does create a completely new environment as well as a new expectations from the customers where the banks need to leverage their key strengths, their core strengths in order to provide relevant solutions. Now at the same time, and it's back to your point, it's obvious that new entrants do have the opportunity to be extremely agile, to leverage the capability of analytics and all of that. So I'll say that um, it's, it's a real significant stimulation based on opportunity for customers to really get new solutions, get new uh, payment means. Okay, so we're seeing that the, the banks face uh, big problems in terms of technological challenges and, and new players coming into the market. Kevin, but we're also identified in the World Payments Report uh, a new regulatory burden. We've got sort of 32 initiatives outlined there. Uh, are the banks seeing that purely as a negative or are they also able to see some upside to those regulations? No, I mean for, from a bank perspective um, we, we've done quite a neat piece of work within the World Payments Report this year in terms of categorising the payments um, by different types of activity and then looking at which ones of those have the potential for innovation. Um, and we concluded that you know, there was quite a large percentage of um, initiatives and bear in mind these initiatives are not just regulatory there some of them are industry initiatives as well would lend themselves to drive innovation in the in the broader payment space so so I think you know, when you look at the, the the landscape of regulatory change um, I, I think you know, whilst there are some clearly regulatory cost driven activities that impact the way banks do business um, from either a prudential perspective, consumer protection wise. Um, there are plenty of opportunities to innovate off some of the other initiatives, for instance, mobile payments, faster payments in the UK, um, to, to actually innovate and change the marketplace. Because are you finding the same sort of thing in, in Japan, that uh, obviously banks don't like lots of new regulations, but if you look at it very carefully, you can see an upside and there's opportunities to create new business models and new forms of business. Right. Yeah. Some areas like risk management, like anti-money laundering or uh, uh, fraud detection, I think uh, regulatory environment would have a positive impact in the way that the bank is coming up with uh, more sophisticated uh, risk management uh, technology. Okay. Now, we, we certainly couldn't uh, con conclude a session like this without talking a little bit about SEPA. So, Kevin, we've got some deadlines now for, for SEPA, uh, but uh, you know, is, it, is, is it all tied up and, and a done thing, or is there still a huge amount of uncertainty around SEPA? Um, I, I think SEPA still has some way to run in terms of the, the full implementation. That's, uh, the deadlines are very helpful um, from a certainty perspective. I think banks are well positioned to, to, to be ready for those deadlines. I think the challenge we're facing now is supporting our corporate clients and, and you know, from, from an RBS perspective we've got clients that operate across Europe um, making sure that we can support them in those payments um, in terms of their day-to-day -day activity and I think the focus is switching towards migration and translation services to support their ability to deliver those SEPA payments into the process within the deadlines. Jean, I mean, a, a third strong theme in the World Payments Report is, uh, is innovation. 
and uh, obviously what banks need to do in order to keep themselves relevant, but also to build a business case for what they're going to do so that it actually makes a profit for their shareholders. Uh, how, how are banks approaching that kind of issue? I think that in terms of business case, if you start saying it's now the outside in, the customer view, the value of the customer, the way to make sure that you are top of mind in their mind share is obviously the first pillar of any business case. So um, we investigate that, we investigate then how should they do that. And then we really uh, um, identify that they should assess their core capabilities, they should make sure that they understand its segment carefully, the key customer that they want to target and the value proposition. And they should then probably find or drill down into some hotspots innovation where they could really make a difference into the value proposition to their customers. Okay. Makoto, I mean, Japan has been very innovative in terms of the, the mobile wallet. How do you see innovation in Japan from now on? I mean, and, and, and how do you sort of do your research into what customers are thinking about and what's going to attract uh, their imagination? Right. In mobile area, we are observing that not just payment, but um, combining different elements like uh, uh, coupons or using a geo location information for um, marketing. All these things are coming together. And we are observing that uh, payment is one element and innovation is uh, built around payment. And retailers, mobile carriers, all uh, different players are coming in to uh, play their role. So uh, financial institution um, or banks need to be um, very agile in order to uh, keep pace with all these changes. Kevin, I mean, we talked a little bit here mostly about retail customers, but what about corporate customers? I mean, what, what sorts of things are they looking for in this new environment? I mean, many of them are kind of transforming their treasury operations and, uh, and, and reviewing their bank relationships. Paul, what we're seeing is yeah, a continued um, you know, deep interaction between the banks and the corporates through their direct ERP systems. And, and again, this links back to the SEPA issue that, that you'll see that a lot of corporates will actually migrate in line with when they upgrade their ERP activity because the two are integrated. Um, I think what we're seeing is connectivity via whether that's SWIFT or via an ERP cloud or direct to the bank, whole range of options supported. But, but I think also the expectation that the richness of data is played back to the corporate um, in a way that they can use it more proactively and interactively um, to enhance their business metrics. Okay. Well, it seems that we're in a, a fast-changing market. Uh, we're seeing uh, how banks can respond to that. There's a huge amount of information available in the World Payments Report 2012. I'd like to thank my guests uh, Jean Lassignardi, Kevin Brown, Makoto Shibata for discussing the World Payments Report 2012 with me. Thank you. People matter, results count.